By faith Enoch was translated, that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became the heir of the righteousness which is by faith. I read in your hearing tonight the story of the faith of three men. This is actually faith before the flood. These three men all live before the flood. They are the only ones mentioned before the flood here. Actually, the 11th chapter of Hebrews is not what a great many folk call it, a catalog of the heroes of faith. It's better to turn that around and say this, that what you have in the 11th chapter of Hebrews is the operation of faith in all ages under all circumstances and conditions of life. And here you see faith before the flood. You see that there has never been a time when it was not by faith. God has never saved anyone except through Jesus Christ. And it's always had to be a step of faith, and faith that would point to the Lord Jesus Christ. And before the flood and after the flood, during the time of the law, and until the Lord Jesus came, everything pointed to him, and it was always by faith. Now you have here in these three men... In Abel, you have the worship of faith. In Enoch, you have the walk of faith. And in Noah, you have the witness of faith. And tonight, I'd like to parade these three men before you, that you might look at them and see how faith operated in their life. First, we have this man Abel. You have the worship of faith. And we read... By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. We have here the worship of faith. These two boys, Cain and Abel, they came to God. One was accepted, the other was rejected. We're told that it was by faith that one offered a more excellent sacrifice than the other. Let's go back and look at that for just a moment. We read in the fourth chapter of Genesis, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, and should be the man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Here are the two boys. We are told now, and in process of time. Actually, the Hebrew would lend itself at the end of days, which means the Sabbath day, up to the time of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the human race worshipped on the Sabbath day. It was even before the flood. It was given as a peculiar covenant between God and Israel. God said that this is a covenant between me and thee, speaking of the children of Israel. It never was given to the church. The church worships on the first day of the week because the seventh day belongs to the old creation. God created the heavens the earth. He rested on the seventh day. That became a holy day for the old creation. But today you and I belong to a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things. That is, we don't go back to the Sabbath. Old things are passed away. These old relationships. All things have become new. And we now worship God, not on the end of the week, 
not at the end of days as it is here, but on the first day of the week we read the early church came together. That is something that is, I think, very important to see. And in process of time or at the end of days, the Hebrew will lend itself to that. It came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And it says in the process of time at the end of days that Cain brought of the fruit, and Abel also brought. And in the Hebrew, the suggestion is that they not only brought it, but they brought it to an appointed place. I ask a preacher this week, I said, do you know Hebrew and Greek? Oh, he says, yes, I know a Hebrew who runs a clothing store and a Greek who runs a restaurant. May I say that it is well sometimes maybe to refer to it, and you'll forgive me for it, but I think this is helpful tonight to see that these men came to a pointed place, and they came on an appointed day, if you please, and they came to worship God. And we are told that Abel he also brought of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, his countenance fell. Now we have here the writer to the Hebrews, therefore, saying that by faith, Abel brought this sacrifice, which throws a great deal more light on it. Why was it that Abel brought a sacrifice? Well, he brought a sacrifice because he brought it by faith. And my friends, if he brought it by faith, evidently they had a revelation from God, because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And there had to be a revelation from God for him to come by faith, and bring the little lamb. In other words, God had told him what to bring. Now, this man Cain ignored it. He brought the fruit of the ground, and I don't think anyone's going to find fault with the fruit. It was lovely as any that you see out at the Pomona Fair. It was lovely fruit, probably the best fruit, but it represented the work of the man's hand, and it was not brought by faith at all. Now Abel brought a little lamb, and he offered that lamb, a bloody lamb. I'm confident had you been there and stepped up to Abel and said to Abel, Why are you offering this lamb? And he says, Because God asked me to. And God asked me to. He said, This is the way that I'm to approach God. Therefore, I'm obeying God in this matter, and I'm bringing the lamb. Well, do you think for one moment, Abel, that that little lamb can save you? No, I really don't. And by the way, if you feel that those two boys, and I've seen pictures of them even in Sunday school literature that make them look like a couple of cavemen, if you feel that for one moment that these two men are cavemen, you're sadly wrong. They just happen to be your ancestors and mine, and they had a higher IQ than any of us here tonight or anyone else, for that matter. These were very intelligent men, both Cain and Abel. So Abel would have said to you and me, of course, I do not believe the blood of bulls and goats can take away sins. Well, then why are you bringing it? He said, I do not understand everything that's in the future. But I do understand this, that God has said, he said to my mother, that he was going to send the man the Savior is coming. That Savior will be the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And this little Lamb that I'm offering is pointing to Him, whoever He is and whenever He comes. And I'm coming by faith to God. So that when God saved Abel, He didn't save him because he was a superior man to Cain. He was not. I always enjoyed hearing the late Dr. Harry Rimmer. He had some very novel interpretations, and one of them was he believed that Cain and Abel were twins. They were brothers. They were twins. I don't think so, but you can't rule it out. I'd like to say this, that if they were not twins, they were closer together and more alike than any two identical twins that you'll find today. And I'll tell you why. You see, tonight, 
all of us that are here present have poured into our bloodstream back of us all sorts of ancestors. And that's the reason today that even when you have twins in a family, one of them may turn out to be a very fine fella, and the other may turn out to be a drunkard, uh, near do well, no good. And you say, why is that? Well, that can be explained this way today. The psychologist can come along and say, well, now I'll tell you what really happened here. This very fine, upstanding fellow takes after an ain't on his mother's side. And the other boy that is the drunkard, he takes after an alcoholic uncle on the father's side. That is the explanation. And it's accepted today because in your bloodstream, in my bloodstream tonight, there is poet, the blood of all kinds of ancestors. And if you really knew tonight your line, you'd be shamed of it. A great many folk, especially in my Southland, like to trace their ancestry back. I have a cousin who is an Episcopalian rector, and he loves to do that sort of thing. And the last time that I ever saw him in person, which was probably 25 years ago, he was telling me about someone he'd found way over in North Carolina somewhere. And I asked him, I said, have you found any horse thieves in the line? And he was greatly shocked that I would even suggest that. And I told him, I said, you better not look too carefully. I have a notion there's some rascals back there somewhere, because every now and then I feel them stirring in my bloodstream. I know that they're back there. They must be back there. My friend, and don't you laugh at you got the same kind of ancestors I've got. But what about Cain and Abel? You can't say that they've inherited anything from an uncle or an aunt, because they didn't have an uncle or an aunt. They only had a pop and mom. That's all. And you just can't explain the difference in the two boys on that basis. And then, of course, there are others that would explain the difference in individuals today on the basis of environment. The idea today, that's the same kind of sociology today that's being used to tear down all the slums and build nice apartments, and you get rid of slums. I know I've been in several cities where 20 years ago they tore down the slums and they put up apartments. Do you know what they have now? They have apartment slums now. You don't get rid of slums because environment, you see, won't change a fella on the inside. He's still the same kind of fella on the inside. Now, you can't explain the difference in these two boys on the basis of environment because both of them had the same father, the same mother, brought up in the same home under the same circumstances. You just can't explain this difference. What is the difference? Writer to the Hebrews says... The difference is in the sacrifice. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And my friend, that makes all the difference in the world tonight in men, is whether they have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or whether they do not have faith. Here, sit here tonight, let's say. This is merely just a supposition. Suppose they sit here tonight, twins. They are known as identical twins. They're alike. They have the same likes. They're dressed alike. But one of them is a Christian and one is not a Christian. Sitting next to the boy that is a Christian, there is tonight a native from Africa, from Uganda. He's come out of the jungle. He has never been to this country before. He's wearing the garment of the jungle. He sits next to this boy. His skin is a different color. His thinking is different. His language is different. Will you listen to me? That native from Uganda and that boy that's the twin that is a Christian are closer together than the twins are. Lots closer together. Those two boys that are Christians are going to be together for eternity. Both of them are in Christ. Both of them are in the body of Christ and in the family of God and their brothers, if you please. The other two boys 
The twins are headed in opposite direction. They're altogether different. Here are two boys. They could have been twins. They're more alike than twins. And at the very beginning, God put down black and white. God said one is right and one is wrong. God says that men will come to me by faith and they'll come by believing what I say. I say they're to bring a sacrifice, that little lamb. And again I say Abel did not know what we know tonight about that little lamb, but he did it by faith. And my friend, tonight if you are saved, you have to come by faith to Jesus Christ who came to this earth 1,900 years ago and died upon a cross for your sins and mine. And it would be wrong tonight for you to bring a lamb because we pass that stage. Christ has come now and everything looks to his coming. As we saw this morning, the writer to the Hebrews says you'd crucify afresh the Son of God if you brought a lamb because you'd say that which the lamb pointed to has not come yet. And that's crucifying Christ afresh. But we come by faith and look back to his coming 1,900 years ago, so that Abel, before the flood, he worshiped God by faith, if you please, by bringing a little bloody sacrifice that pointed to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the second man here walked by faith. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. He was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Marvelous testimony that this man Enoch had. And Enoch lived in a very difficult day, by the way. It was a day that it was said of it, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That was in Noah's day, and it was in Enoch's day. Now, Enoch is in the line of Adam, and it's in the genealogy that's in the fifth chapter of Genesis, and it's a rather monotonous genealogy, as all of them are. It says, so-and-so lived so many years, he begat somebody, and then he died. And I said, that's the story, that's the biography of all of them, until you come to Enoch, and then things change. Here is the thing that is said, and again and again you read like this, All the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. That is true of all of these here, until you come to Enoch. Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. That's always been interesting to me. He lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah, and then he walked with God. What did he do that first sixty-five years? I don't know. I have a notion he did not walk with God. But one day there appeared in his home a little baby. And he went in and he looked down at this little baby. We always think of Methuselah with a bed that he tripped over. But honestly, there was one time when he was a little baby and he was in the crib. And Enoch went and looked down in that crib and he saw that little baby. And he said, I'm going to walk with God from now on. You know, a little child will lead them. I'm of the opinion that if a child in the home will not bring you to God, nothing will bring you to God. No use for a preacher to talk with you. I used to run around with two other fellas when I was growing up before I was actually saved, and we called ourselves the Three Musketeers, and we got in a great deal of trouble. After I was converted, one of the fellows ridiculed me a great deal. He married, and he had a little boy when I went back to Nashville. The little boy, I talked with him, and he merely laughed. And then one day he called me and said, Would you come out to the hospital? My boy is there, and he's very sick. A little fella, four or five years old. So I went out, and by the time I got there, the little fellow was dying. He said to me, Ed said, Mac, pray for him. I said, that sounds funny coming from you. I said, why do you want me to pray for him? Well, he said, I don't want God to take him. Well, I said, he'll be better off if God takes him now when he, while he can get him. 
than to stay in your home where you're bringing him up. Oh, he said, I'll change. I said, will you? I said, would you right here now accept Christ? Well, he said, I won't go that far yet. Let's see if he gets well. Well, I said, I will pray for God's will to be done, and that's all I can pray for. And I prayed for that. I said, oh, God, use this to convert Ed. I said, he's my friend. I've loved him in the past. I'd love to see him saved. The little fella died. It made this fella better. As far as I know, he's never turned to God. He said to me, he asked me to have the funeral of the little boy. He said to me, you tell me God is a God of love taking my little boy? I said, God loves that little boy lots more than you do, because God got him when he could get him. He got him when he could get him, and he couldn't get you. And I don't know whether he ever got that. I do know this, that if a little child won't bring you to God when one appears in your home, I don't think i got anything to say to you. I mean, I can't add to that. The little child shall lead them, the Lord Jesus said. And one day, Enoch went and looked down in the crib, and there's a little Methuselah. Oh, he says, i got to walk with God. And from that day on, he walked with God. And he walked so close with God that God took him. And the little girl that came home from Sunday school, and I don't know how better to say it than the little girl said it. Her mother said to her, what did you study about today in Sunday school? She said, we studied about Enoch. She says, well, what about Enoch? Well, she said that Enoch and God used to take a walk together every day. And God would come by and say to Enoch, says, let's take a walk. And Enoch would say, all right, I'd like to walk with you. And God and Enoch would walk together. And one day God came by and said to Enoch, let's take a walk. And Enoch said, fine. And they started taking a walk, and they got so interested that it got late. And finally, Enoch says, My, we are a long ways from my home. And God says, You're closer to my home than you are to your home. So you just come on and go home with me. And Enoch went home with God. Now, I don't know how to say it any better than that. The Word of God says that he was not, for God took him. And the writer to the Hebrews says that by faith, Enoch walked with God. It's a tremendous statement. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. He was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. How did he do it? He did it by faith. Here is a man who walked with God by faith. And don't tell me that he had it easy that he lived in a day when it was comparatively easy to walk with God. He lived in a very dark day, a day that was moving very swiftly to the flood. And this man, on a day like that, he walked with God. It's a marvelous, wonderful testimony, if you please, concerning this man. And the writer to the Hebrews goes on to say, But without faith it's impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And here's a man that lived in that day when men were turning away from God, and he turned to God. He walked with God, and he walked with God by faith, and God took him. I think he's a picture, must be a picture of the rapture of the church, because God took him out right before the flood, just as I think he'll take the church out of this world before the great tribulation, before the judgment comes upon the earth. This man was delivered from judgment because of the fact that he walked with God by faith. And he looked out yonder to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and God saved him by faith. Now, will you notice this third man that we're looking at tonight? He, in many ways, is the most interesting one of all. He lived on both sides of the flood. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now, God brought the flood 
after the death of Methuselah. In fact, if you'll trace this down, I have a chart that will show this, that the day the flood came, or the year the flood came, is the year that Methuselah died. Have you ever wondered why he lived so long? Lived longer than any other man? And the reason that he lived so long is, his name means ascending forward. When God sent him forth, God says, as long as he's in the world, I'll not send the judgment of the flood. But the minute that he disappears off the earth, you better start looking for high ground, because I intend to send the judgment upon the earth. Now, as long as they could see Brother Methuselah walking about, it was all right. But one day he died, and that year the flood came, if you please. Now, God was very patient. During all that time, there was a building up, as there is today of the sin, the iniquity, the rebellion, the lawlessness on the earth. God saw that the wickedness of of man was great in the earth. Notice this, the piling up of modifiers, and that every imagination, not just some imagination, but every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. There wasn't a good thought in the crowd. It was only evil, and it was continually I have been this past two weeks, first week in a hotel, this past week in a motel, and I ate in a restaurant where these traveling men, apparently Lodi must be a place for traveling men to spend the night, and I would listen to them, especially at breakfast time. I listened the other morning to a group of men who sell bottles to these wineries. They're fine-looking men. There wasn't a man in it. It wasn't well-dressed man, intelligent-looking man. I listened to their conversation. May I say to you, I thought of this verse of Scripture. The only thing in the world these men could talk about was something evil. I never heard a noble thought. I never heard any fine sentiment expressed by any of them. They were talking about sin, something dirty, something filthy. That was their thought. And I thought, my, it's becoming in America today just like the days before the flood that brought the judgment. Now, God waited all those years. Why did he wait? Because God says he's long-suffering, he's patient, it's not his will that any should perish. Now, God waited 900 years to send the flood. And I'll ask any reasonable person, how much longer do you want God to wait? He's been waiting now, I think, a long time to end this particular age that we're in. I don't know when he'll end it. It may not be as close as some of us seem to think that it is. May I say to you that he's patient. God's long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, and he just lets this keep building up. Now, the reason that he reached in at the time of the flood was because of this. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way, that is, God's way, upon the earth. So that all flesh is now in a state of corruption, and there's only one man. And if God does not intervene now, it'll be too late after Noah. He's the last man that's left. Now, you could have found several before Noah. But by the time you get to Noah, he's the only one that's left. You talk about a minority. He's a minority in the world. There are several million people on top side of the earth. Now, God says to this man, I want you to build an ark. I'm going to send a flood. I want to submit to you that here's one of the bravest men. I think he had to guard the thing at night to keep the hoodlums from destroying the ark. And all day long, he was ridiculed. Here's a man building a boat, high and dry, way up, do you know where he built that thing? Way up the Euphrates River. And friends, you just don't build a boat like that up the Euphrates River. There's no water up there to float the thing at all. How in the world is he going to float that boat? And why in the world is he building it? Now, he's doing it by faith. We're told that it was by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, they haven't appeared. There was no water. But God said there's going to be water. 
God says, I'm going to send a flood, he believes it. Now today, we are told that in the last days there'll be scoffers walking after their own lust, saying, where's the sign of his coming? All things continue as they are from the foundation of the earth. A man said to me, and he's up in the hotel, he and I was sitting at the table eating lunch, and he got to talking, and he said, well, what are you doing here in Eugene? I said, well, I'm speaking to these Baptists here. And he said, well, he says, you know, well, I'll tell you what he said he was. He says, I'm a Presbyterian. But that's all he was. He was not a saved man. And he said, are you the fellow that's going to give that illustrated message here on Thursday night? And I said, yes. He said, do you really think Jesus is coming again? I said, yes. He says, you know, that's absurd to me. He said, if you just pardon me, he said, he's a very nice, sociable fellow, very courteous. He says, if you just pardon me, he says, that's absurd to me. I says, I imagine it is. I said, you know, you've got to be right with the first coming of Christ before you can even talk about the second coming. I said, candidly, I, I don't even care to discuss the second coming with you. I would like to discuss the first coming. He said, oh, no, I've got an engagement. May I say to you today that in the last days there'll be scoffers walking out there on lust. So where is the sign of his coming? You mean to tell me you think he's coming? I don't see any sign. There's no evidence. Well, my friend, the day the flood came, there wasn't a cloud in the sky that morning. People went about their work as usual. Now, I want to tell you what really happened. You hear people say that, this man Noah never made a convert. That's not exactly accurate. He did make a convert. He preached 120 years, and it didn't seem that he had a convert, but he saved his own family. And, you know, that's something that all of us ought to think about and ought to be a real concern about. What about your family? Are you going to get them all saved? I'm afraid some of us get so concentrated on the world that we forget about maybe our own loved ones. And I can't think of anybody that ought to be interested in our loved ones except those of us that are the loved ones. Noah saved his family. He got all of his boys in. And I'm of the opinion that when he was building that ark and got it rolling pretty well, that the Gray and Tanner bus company that runs tours ran a tour out of Babylon out to see it. That was, if you were a tourist in Babylon in that day, that would not only show you the old Tower of Babel, but they'd take you out to show you this very interesting thing that's happening, is the building here of a boat on dry land. And they said it's the most ridiculous thing in the world. I think the boys had left home, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, the three boys. I'm of the opinion that probably Japheth was over in the business world. He probably was an executive in some corporation in Babylon. One day, one of the salesmen came in, and they were having a sales meeting, and he was meeting with them, and one of the fellows there said, You know, up in my territory, the funniest thing in the world is happening. And he said, well, What is it? Well, there's a fellow building a boat on dry land, and you know what he says? He preaches you a sermon, and he says that God is going to send a flood on this earth, and we haven't had rain up in that country for several years. Isn't that ridiculous? And this fellow Japheth says, By the way, what's his name? He says his name is Noah. Japheth says, You know, that's my dad. Now he says, I hadn't heard about that before because I've gotten away from home, and I've gotten away from God, and I've gotten away from everything, but I want to tell you fellas this. If my dad says God says a flood's coming, I want you fellas to buy some hip boots. A flood's coming. And I, for one, am going up home to find out. And he went home and said to his dad when he arrived, Give me a hammer and some nails. I want to help you. You see, they knew, these boys knew their dad. And they knew the faith in their home. And I think that Shem got out into politics, and he was elected to some high office. And one day one of the politicians came in and said, one of the legislators came in and said, up in my district, I've been up there politicking, getting votes, 
And do you know I ran into a fellow building a boat up there on dry land? Shem says, I happen to know your district is my district too, and I knew you were up for election, and I knew you'd been up there, and I'd like to ask you who it was. He says, it's a fellow by the name of Noah, says God says he's going to send a flood. Isn't that preposterous? And Shem says, if you had said anybody else was building the boat, I would have said it was preposterous. But he says, you see, that fellow Noah's my dad, and I happen to be brought up in that home. And as a politician, I may have stretched the truth at times, but my dad never did stretch it. If my dad says God appeared to him, God appeared to him. I'm going home. And Ham, he had gone down, and he was a professor in the University of Babylon. And they were having a meeting at the beginning of the year of the faculty. And the different members of the faculty were telling what they had done during the summer. And one man said, you know, I teach geology. And I've been up in the country looking at the rocks up there. And I want to tell you, I found one. I found one of the most unusual fellows you've ever seen. He's building a boat on dry land, and to me, that's ridiculous. And I tried to tell him that it's not scientific, that and according to science, it can never rain up here, and there never will be a flood up here. He is preposterous. And Ham, who's Dr. Ham now, and he says, by the way, what was the name of the man? Well, it says his name is Noah. Noah? He said, you know, that's my father. And the other professor said, well, I'm very sorry for what I said, but I still think that there's something wrong with him. And I think Ham says, just a moment. I know that it's unscientific. And I know that according to our books that we have today, that there will be no flood. But he says, I happen to know my dad. And I do know that when I was raised in that home, that he was a godly man and he knew God. And if he says there's a flood coming, I want to tell you, fellas, you can put your books aside and you better go to the top floor. It's coming. And on the way home... And I'm through. I'm asking for a leave of absence, and I think it'll be permanent. I'm going to go up, and on the way, I'm going to buy me a hammer and saw. I'm going to help my dad. And it wasn't long until the three boys were there helping him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. He prepared an ark to the saving of his house. He saved his house. That's the witness of faith. And my friend, that's needed today as the witness of faith. I remember hearing Dr. Philpot, and he was pastor of this church years ago, a wonderful preacher. I heard him the first time I ever heard him was downstairs in the old auditorium before it was remodeled, Hall A. I heard him tell this story. He was talking to a group of ministers down there. He said, when I was a young preacher, I was a pastor in Ohio, and I think he said it was on the B&O Railroad. I'm not sure which one, but I think that was what he said. He said that in this little town... I had a man who was the chief officer in this little church. And generally in a little church like that, you find one man that's probably carrying the load. And this was the man. He was up in years. He had two boys. One boy was in Chicago, a successful businessman, and the other boy was in Pennsylvania, a successful businessman. So... The boy in Chicago was a Christian. The boy in Pennsylvania was not. And that was the burden of this father. Dr. Philpott says, as a young preacher, I used to go and visit with him. He'd sit in an old rocking chair by his bedside because he had to get back in bed even during the daytime. And 
He said the great burden of his heart was that boy in Pennsylvania. And he'd say, when you pray, pray for him. I seem to have failed in raising that boy. So uh, the old man got worse. Dr. Phil Potts said he was one of these wonderful fellows, said they never paid me very much as a preacher, and he'd always come around and slip me a check for $25 every now and then. He said, my, that was wonderful. said he was that type of a man. And then said one day he died. He said, I sent a wire to both of the boys, and they came immediately. The funeral service was held. He says, I preached the gospel the best I knew how because he had told me, he says, when I die, my boy from Pennsylvania will be there, and I want him to hear the gospel, and you preach the gospel to him. And Dr. Philpott said, I did the best I could. And, and then after the funeral service, he said it was on a Saturday, and I had to prepare my sermons for Sunday, and I went back to the church. And he said, my study was upstairs above the pulpit. And he said, I went up there. The light was on. He said, the boy that lived in Chicago came and said, my train from Chicago is getting ready to leave in a little while, and I wanted to come by and thank you for the way you conducted Dad's funeral. I want to thank you for everything that you said. I believe every bit of it. And then he told about how wonderful his dad had been to him, and he did want to carry on. And he said, now I happen to know that he was the one really paying your salary, and you can count on me to take care of that from now on. You'll get a check every month from me. Dr. Philpott said it always came in. And said he was busy there in the study after that visit, and he was really working, and he heard the knock downstairs, and he said, come in and... The other boy, grown fella now, of course, both of them were, and this boy came upstairs. He said, I've been over at the house. said, I've been in Dad's room. He said, I went and I sat down in that old rocking chair, and I knew that he's always sat there. And he said, I also knew this, that he always prayed for me. And I've been in rebellion all these years. But he said, you may be interested to know. A little while ago, I knelt down by that rocking chair, and I did what my dad wanted me to do all my life, and that was to accept Christ as my Savior. And I accepted him as my Savior. And he said, if you don't believe it, here's a check for $1,000 in memory of my dad. And he said, you can count on me to support this church from now on. And he bade that fella goodbye. When he went down the steps, he turned around. He said, I wonder if there's any way to let my dad know that I've come to Christ. And Dr. Phil Potts says, well, I don't know whether there will be or not, but I'm sure going to ask the Lord to tell him, because I think it would even rejoice his heart in heaven to know that. May I say to you tonight, the witness of faith, it has a witness always has a witness, whether it's before the flood, after the flood, or in Los Angeles in 1964. We worship by faith, we walk by faith, and we witness by faith. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? As we bow our heads tonight in this closing moment, I'm wondering, in this congregation tonight, Probably you come in here without Christ, or you're not sure of your relationship to him. And that's one of the things that the epistle to the Hebrews deals with, that you can know that you're God's child. Warnings are put up, but amidst all those warnings and assurances given to the heart that you can know this wonderful Savior. My friend, I'm not being sentimental at all, nor am I appealing to emotion. I'm appealing to your faith tonight, but it may be you had a godly mother or dad, and you're far from the God of your father and your mother. You're far from the God, maybe of the friend that has loved you. May I say to you that God will receive you. He took these three boys into that ark and saved them because of the witness 
of a father. And tonight, God will save you. I don't know who you are, how you are, why you are, but I do know this, that God will save you. But if he saves you, you'll have to come by faith. You'll not bring a sacrifice tonight, but by simple faith, looking to Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He bore your sin 1,900 years ago, and by faith you can trust him tonight and know your sins are forgiven.